and uh, welcome to today's uh, climate outlook for the central U.S., covering everything from the Rockies over to the Appalachians. Uh, today's briefer is Wendy Ryan. She is the assistant state climatologist for the state of Colorado at Colorado State University. Uh, we will hold uh, any questions until the end, and uh, at this time, uh, Wendy, it's all yours. Okay, thank you, John. Uh, welcome, everyone, to today's briefing. Uh, just a photo there on the opening slide of uh, some grasshoppers we've been seeing out um, in the Plains region. This one is in southeastern Nebraska from uh, early March. You can see March 13th. So just pointing to some of the drier conditions we've been seeing across the region. Um, just uh, a little information on who's providing climate services to the central region. That's a collaboration with uh, Dennis Toddy from South Dakota uh, he's a state climatologist there, Jim Angel from Illinois, uh, Doug Cluck and John Eisbull from NOAA, uh, state climatologists, the Midwest Regional Climate Center, the High Plains Regional Climate Center, the Climate Prediction Center, Iowa State University, University and the National Drought Mitigation Center. The next uh, climate and drought webinar will be on April 16th, and that will be Dennis Toddy from South Dakota will be doing that briefing then. Uh, you can access the future climate webinars from this link here. If you sign up, you don't have to sign up every month. You'll be re-registered for each month. And you can always access the past presentations from either the Midwest Regional Climate Center or the High Plains using the links at the bottom of the slide. So we're going to talk about current conditions across the region today. We'll look at temperatures, precipitation, snowpack, soil moisture, stream flows, um, impacts that we're seeing around the region, as well as the climate outlooks going toward uh, this summer. Nothing on floods. Hey, John, you might want to mute everybody. Yes, and if everybody could uh, just uh, check their phone and do star six uh, to mute, uh, we'd sure appreciate that. Thank you. And then when we get to questions, uh, you'll just do star six again to unmute your line. Sure appreciate your cooperation. Wendy? And there will be a slide on floods. I just didn't have it on the agenda there. Uh, so this slide is looking at the month-to-date temperature departures from normal, so going back to March 1st. Um, what we see is some particularly warm air over much of the region. You can see it extending from Montana east into Wisconsin, south into Kansas, um, particularly warm over the Dakotas, in particular South Dakota, where anomalies are upwards of 8 to 10 degrees above normal for the start of March there. Um, farther east into eastern Iowa, Missouri, Illinois, Indiana, Ohio, we were seeing cooler than average temperatures, mainly in that zero to six degrees below normal for the start of March. So a little discrepancy across the region to start March um, and fairly normal temperatures over uh, eastern Wyoming and Colorado, warmer out west of the Continental Divide to start March. And it has warmed up quickly in March. Um, several, these are some climate stats we have from across the region. Um, setting all-time March maximum temperatures at Grand Island, Nebraska, with 90 degrees on March 16th. Uh, Norfolk, Nebraska, 92 degrees on that same day. North Platte, Nebraska, 91 degrees on March 16th. Uh, Rapid City, South Dakota, also with an all-time high March temperature of 84 degrees, and that was on the 15th. Of and even in Colorado, along the eastern plains, we're seeing our earliest 80-degree days ever, um, which happened in Denver, Fort Collins, and Colorado Springs. Um, again, on March 16th, so that was a particularly warm day across the region. This map is showing stations across the region that have set daily maximum temperature records from the 1st to the 17th of March, so you can see across the region uh, in western South Dakota, much of Nebraska, Kansas, and Colorado, much of Iowa, and even northwestern Missouri setting uh, high temperature records to start off March as even a few up in North Dakota and uh, Minnesota as well, and one lonely one there in Illinois with 65 degrees setting a new record. If we look at the 30-day de temperature departure from normal, this goes back to February 16th. Not quite as warm on this depiction. You can see Montana and western Colorado in that zero to three degrees above normal, but much of the rest of the region below normal temperatures, uh, zero to six degrees below normal from Wyoming west into Iowa and south into Kansas. But once you get east of there, uh, we're seeing a little bit cooler temperatures for the 30-day departure, uh, 6 to 12 degrees below normal um, with, <coughs> excuse me, Illinois, Indiana, Ohio, and Kentucky, and those cooler temperatures. 
but excuse me, Wendy, I'm going to mute everyone's line, and then if you could just do star six to get yourself back on. Uh, thank yep. you. Just a moment. Okay, hopefully I'm back now. Um, yes, I can hear you. Okay, good. <laughs> so here are the statewide temperature rankings for February. Um, so looking at the statewide composites, we definitely see this discrepancy between the western U.S. and the eastern U.S. where we're having uh, warmer than normal temperatures for February from Montana down through Colorado, particularly warm in Wyoming, 100, ranking 115th out of 121 years um, in Wyoming. Fairly normal temperatures from the Dakotas south to Kansas, but then once you get east of there, we're seeing those cooler than average temperatures for February, uh, with Ohio the coolest coming in much below average, ranking second um, in terms of February temperatures, uh, third in Michigan, fifth in Indiana and Kentucky. Um, so just pointing to that cooler weather in February in the eastern U.S. as opposed to the western U.S. If we look at the winter period for December through February, again, we see that same kind of contrast. Um, but a little bit warmer through the Central Plains. So we're seeing really, again, really warm through Wyoming, ranking 118th out of 120 years um, for the December through February period, um, warmer than above average through the Central Plains from the Dakotas south to Kansas, and then not quite as drastic on the cold temperatures for the December through February period in the eastern U.S. Um, from Missouri to Ohio and down into Kentucky, um, just in that below average category. Looking at precipitation, on the left we're throwing, showing the 30-day precipitation percentage of normal. Um, what really points out in this graphic is the, ex the expanse of the dryness over most of the, the region. Uh, we can see wetter than average um, precipitation for the 30-day period over central Wyoming and central, or excuse me, southern and eastern Colorado. And then we also see those above average precipitation amounts marching across southern Missouri, uh, Illinois, Indiana, Ohio, and Kentucky, really winning out on all the moisture here over the 30-day period. But north and west of there, um, from Montana, uh, east into Michigan, and south into Kansas, particularly dry over the 30-day period. It is a climatically dry period for much of this area, but still pointing to the, the dry conditions over the 30-day period. Uh, the graphic on the right is looking at the water year. That goes back to October 1, 2014. Uh, through March 17th. It looks a little bit better on um, this depiction when, when we w I widen that uh, time frame there. But we still see a lot of dryness over the Dakotas and Minnesota, 25 to 50 percent of normal for the water year in some locations. Um, <coughs> it's also particularly dry um, across much of the central part of the region, but not quite as dry as those northern portions. Um, above average moisture for the water year over portions of Montana, Wyoming, uh, eastern Colorado, and then again, uh, the southern portions of Missouri, Illinois, Indiana, Ohio, and particularly Kentucky with above average moisture for the water year. And the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, uh, good on moisture for the water year. These are looking kind of at the same graphics as we had for temperature, but now we're looking at February precipitation. You can see the only state coming in with above normal moisture for February was Colorado um, in that above average category. Uh, normal conditions on much of the western portion of the region, and once you head east, then we're seeing those below average conditions from South Dakota east into Ohio, um, from Michigan down to Illinois, Indiana, and Ohio. Um, but not, per not very dry, just below average for the February ranking. If we look at the winter rankings from December through February, we see normal conditions over much of the western portion of the region. Um, but dry conditions persisting over the northern portion of the region and the eastern portion of the region in those below average categories. This is looking um, at modeled snow depths. Um, you can see we've got snow in the Rockies where it belongs. Um, we've also got some snow, not very much, just a trace to two inches over much of Montana and then western north and south Dakota, but not much to talk about east of there except for the upper peninsula of Michigan. If we look at this product as an anomaly, uh, you can see where the snow should be. And with those warmer colors, uh, we would normally see snow cover over the northern portion of the region. We just don't have that snow cover right now. Not that it hasn't snowed there. We've just seen a lot of melt-off um, of that snowpack this season. And you can also see the, the lack of snow uh, really prevalent over northern Minnesota, Wisconsin, and the western portion of the upper peninsula of Michigan. 
this is looking at the snowtail west-wide snowpack percentages of normal. So this is really looking at the high elevation snowtail locations, um, very dry over the Pacific Northwest with single digit percents of normal. So not looking quite as bad as, as the Pacific North, Northwest in our region, but you can see some below average basins in our region, just a few just slightly above normal, but the majority of them are, are below normal um, for the date. Um, particular, particularly dry um, over northern Montana, southeastern Wyoming, and western Colorado. So the Colorado Basin not doing particularly good in Colorado, but the South Platte and the Arkansas Basin is doing pretty good. Um, if we look just at the Missouri River Basin, you can see the total uh, snow water equivalent above Fort Peck is at 78% of normal. So we're looking here, the red line is the average, the blue is the current snowpack, and then we've got some high and low years in there for reference. Um, so above Fort Peck, 78% of normal. From Fort Peck to Garrison, 88% of normal. But of note is the lack of snow accumulation over the past few weeks in both of these basins. If you go a little bit farther south and look at the Platte River basins, you can see the total in the North Platte system is at 77% of normal and the South Platte just slightly below normal at 96% of normal. Uh, this product is looking at modeled soil moisture across the region. Um, we can see the western part portion of the region doing pretty good on soil moisture and actually reporting wet soils across much of Montana, Wyoming, and uh, central Colorado, and then the eastern Dakotas. But once we go east of there, we're seeing the soils dry out um, considerably um, from eastern Dakotas south into Kansas and east into northern Ohio, I, Iowa looking okay, and then southern Illinois, um, Indiana, Ohio, and Kentucky doing well with wet soils there in Kentucky with the storms that they've received. But um, really highlighting that the dryness over Minnesota, <coughs> southern Wisconsin, northern Illinois, northern and western Ohio, as well as Michigan. This is taking data from many state mesonets, um, using data from the High Plains Regional Climate Center, the Midwest Regional Climate Center, uh, South Dakota's mesonet, as well as Colorado. Colorado is the only mesonet that has soil temperature at two inches. The rest of these are reported at four inches. But what we see is over the northern portions of the region, we've got frozen soil still. But as we go farther south, and even from South Dakota south, we're seeing unfrozen soils, which means any um, moisture that falls will have the opportunity to soak into the soil and recharge soil moisture, whereas if the soils are still frozen, you tend to see some of that moisture run off and not recharge um, the soil moisture. Here we're looking at the seven-day average stream flow map from the USGS. Um, Western rivers looking pretty good until you get into Nebraska and Kansas and the Republican and the Arkansas River basins where we're seeing some very low flows, much below normal for the seven-day average. Um, you get east of Nebraska and things are looking okay uh, through Iowa <laughs> down through Missouri and then even farther east into the, into the region we're seeing record high flows um, from Ohio down through Kentucky with the moisture that they've received as of late. I'm just pointing um, how we're seeing that respond in the river systems. And then a few lower than normal uh, flows in northern Minnesota and the upper peninsula of Michigan. Looking at the Great Lakes, um, there was an interesting article that came out of EOS this week um, talking about how the surge of water levels in the Great Lakes has occurred um, from January 2013 through December 2014. Lake Superior rose about two feet, which was the highest ever rise for that tw specific 24-month period, period from January 2013 to December 2014, so that January to December period. Uh, the Michigan Huron uh, system rose about 3.3 feet, and that was nearly equal to a rise they saw in 1950 and 1951. Um, they're attributing this to just persistent near to above average rises in nearly every month on Lake Superior, most notably in the spring and summer. But Michigan Huron actually rose in the fall as well. And it's fairly unusual to see those um, lakes rise during the fall months from, uh, from September to October. Only 11 other years saw the lake rev levels rise. Um, from September to October. Uh, some impacts because of high water would be shoreline flooding and erosion as well as potential property damage. Um, but there's also some benefits from it, some economic relief for commercial shipping operations, hydropower as well as recreation. And there's a great picture from Halloween last year um, that was found on Flickr. It was actually in the article um, showing the, the coastal flooding there on, the, on Lake Michigan. Uh, if we look at the Great Lakes 
ice cover, you can see that the lakes are currently 52.2% covered with ice, whereas last year they were still 82% covered with ice. So seeing that ice melt off a little bit quicker this year than last year. So some of the regional impacts we've been experiencing, the dry, warm, and windy weather has dried out some soils and grasses across um, particularly Nebraska, Colorado, Kansas, and Iowa, causing some grass fires that we'll probably see until we start to see those grasses green up. Um, the lack of snow on the ground is, has caused a rapid warm up over portions of the region, particularly North Dakota, and that lack of snow cover causes some concerns for growing season soil moisture um, with that lack of snow on the ground. Some low stock pond levels through Kansas and Nebraska where we saw some of those lowest uh, soil moisture percentiles um, and lower than normal snowpack in the high country uh, will likely result in lower than normal runoff and reduced reservoir storage levels. And just talking a little bit more about that fire danger, this is looking at the observed fire danger for the 17th of March. This is from the Forest Service. Um, you can really see the areas we pointed out as being dry, Minnesota, Wisconsin, uh, northern Illinois, and northern Michigan, as well as Nebraska and Kansas and northern uh, <coughs> excuse me, Missouri, in that high to very high um, fire danger for the date. And if we look at the wildland fire potential outlook for April, you can see kind of that same region uh, omitting Kansas and Nebraska, though, uh, with increasing to above normal chances from Minnesota south into Kentucky, um, east into Missouri, or excuse me, west into Missouri and east into uh, Indiana, and particularly um, over you can see much of South Dakota there being included in that fire potential. Some of the agricultural impacts across the region, the warmer and drier weather does have a few positive impacts for now. It's good news for ranchers who are going to be calving. The, the drier, the warmer weather makes it easier on both the ranchers and the cattle, um, much better than snowy cold conditions. And getting equipment into fields should be a little bit easier due to the lack of snow on the ground. You don't have to wait for that mud to dry out to get some um, equipment into those fields. Uh, very little impact to rangeland being reported at this time. Uh, winter wheat, we have reports of some winter wheat emerging. The drier areas, particularly in Kansas, um, where we heard that they're seeing some, of, some damage to the winter wheat that has come up from wind and even some blowing dust um, in the drier areas. And small grain planting has begun in South Dakota. This is the U.S. Drought Monitor that was just released today. Um, you can see a large portion of abnormally dry and moderate drought over the northern portion of the basin, pointing, pointing or not the basin, the region, pointing to those areas I talked about that were drier, um, particularly Minnesota. Uh, we still have persistent drought in southeastern Colorado and western Kansas um, that is still in the severe category, and even extreme drought creeping up from the southwest in Kansas, and as well the western slope of Colorado much of it in that moderate drought category due to low snowpack numbers this year. This is looking at the one month change. So since the last time um, the climate webinar was done, you can see the one class degradation and even two class in Wisconsin degradation over much of the northern portion uh, in, as well as Nebraska and Kansas. And then eastern portion of the basin, you can see Kentucky having one to two class improvement in the drought categories since the last time, since one month ago. Now we'll change gears and look at the climate outlooks. We'll look at the seven-day precip seven precipitation forecast, the eight to 14-day outlook. We'll look at the April forecast, the spring and summer outlook, as well as the seasonal drought outlook. This is the seven-day quantitative, quantitative precipitation forecast. You can see much of the region expecting some precipitation over the four-day, excuse me, the seven-day period. Uh, bullet of about an inch in northern Minnesota and North Dakota, about seven-tenths of an inch, a little bit drier in Wyoming. Um, in Nebraska, not too much in Colorado except for the southern portion of the state. And then you can see um, that storm track kind of march east. And we see a big swath of a half to three quarter of an inch over much of the eastern portion of the region. And a bullseye right over, um, <coughs> excuse me, Iowa, 1.1 inches, of southern Iowa there, of 1.1 inches. And even over northern Michigan of almost an inch. So some good moisture forecast over the, over the next seven day period. We look at the 8 to 14 day outlooks, which take us from March 26th to April 1st. Um, you can see warmer than normal temperatures forecast over much of the western portion of the United States and cooler than normal temperatures forecast 
um, over the eastern portion of the United States. These are higher chances of cooler than average temperatures over much of the eastern portion of the region, and then normal temperatures um, over the central portion, portion of the region. If we look at precipitation, you can see a big uh, bullseye of higher than normal chances of below average precipitation over the areas where drought was just introduced. So focusing mainly over uh, Minnesota there and expanding into the Dakotas and east into Michigan, south into northern Iowa. Um, and then the eastern portion of the region in Illinois, Indiana, Ohio, Kentucky, in the forecast for chances for above average precipitation in the 8 to 14 day outlook. The rest of the region, equal chances of, of above or below average precipitation. Uh, El Nino update, uh, you can see on the top here we've got the time series of the Nino 3.4 sea surface temperature anomaly. We've been warmer than normal in the Pacific uh, for several months now. Um, on the right, you see the forecast there where we're looking at the different types of models forecasting those sea surface temperature anomalies. Um, so El Nino has officially been declared, but it is weak, and it is developing at an abnormal time of year. We normally see this ramp up in the fall and winter where we have stronger relationships with El Nino. Um, that graphic on the right, the, the dots that are filled in are dynamical models. The hollow symbols are statistical models, and you can see that they're really not agreeing on what's going to happen. Uh, to sea surface temperature, some trending towards warmer, some trending towards cooler. Um, El Nino can suppress tornado activity. There's an article referenced here at the bottom if you want to take a look at that um, that points to the lack of tornadoes this season so far. And there is a slight tendency for El Nino years to have less extremes um, across our region. So the true impacts for summer are complicated and still being discussed at this time um, with this odd El Nino that we've got going right now. Just some El Nino resources if you're interested in looking a little bit more with how El Nino affects your region. Um, this useful to usable web page is really helpful um, for picking things like El Nino and understanding what, that, what implications that has at different times of year for your area of the country, as well as these regional two-page outlooks that are being produced. Um, this one is for the Midwest region, but they're also done for the Great Plains and, and Central region overall. Just a little bit of educational material. Uh, the NOAA Spring Flood Outlook was issued just this morning. Uh, you can see there's a 50% chance of exceeding moderate flood levels in eastern Kansas and Missouri, um, mainly rain and thunderstorm driven, and it's typical for that area to receive minor flooding from thunderstorms in, in the spring months. Uh, also expecting moderate flooding in the lower Ohio River Basin from the melting snow and heavy rains that area has experienced. The soils are primed and the streams are are full and it's persisting that flood risk, uh, mainly in Kentucky, southern Illinois, and southwest Indiana. This is the one month outlook uh, from the Climate Prediction Center looking at the forecast for April 2015. You can see for temperature, much of the region forecasts have equal chances of above or below average temperatures. Uh, when you get into the eastern portion of the region through Michigan, um, Indiana, Ohio, we have those higher chances for below average temperatures. And then if we look at the precipitation, again, that dryness persists, bulleted over um, Minnesota and Wisconsin, those higher chances for below average precipitation. Um, in the southwestern portion of the region, Colorado, really the only state uh, forecast to have ch chances for above average precipitation and a little bit into Kansas there. This is the same product looking at the three-month outlook. So this is for April, May, June. Um, you see that warm in the west kind of spill into the northern portion of our region, so higher chances for above average temperatures uh, from Montana east into Michigan, and then a little bit farther south, equal chances of above or below average temperature for the April, May, June period. Looking at precipitation, again, they hold on to that dryness over the northern portion where we've got drought just introduced. Um, and higher chances for above average precipitation. You see that creep not only into Colorado, but also up into Wyoming, um, and just a little bit into Kansas as well. And the June, July, August outlook, again, you see the, the, temp, the warm temperatures hang around uh, the northern portion of the region, the higher chances for above average temperatures in that area and the eastern portion of the region, equal chances south and west of there. And the only precipitation really being forecast for our area would be over Colorado, Wyoming, Kansas, western Kansas, and western Nebraska with those higher chances for above average moisture for June, July, and August. 
And then this is the seasonal drought outlook. So taking all of those forecasts and the current U U.S. drought monitor into consideration, you can see over the northern portion of the region, the drought is forecast to persist or intensify, as well as seeing it expand a little bit farther beyond its current reach, uh, a little bit farther into Dakota, into the Dakotas, and a little bit farther uh, into Wisconsin and the upper peninsula of Michigan. The drought in southeastern Colorado and western Kansas is we're looking at that to remain but improve, um, or some of it even be removed, um, mainly in Kansas there. Um, that is very good news since th this area has been experienced drought for four to five years now, depending on your location. Um, and unfortunately, the drought in western Colorado is it's looking like that is going to persist or intensify. So just a summary of the recent conditions, the recent warm and dry across much of the region is still short-lived. That the drought in Minnesota and up in the farther northern portions was just added to the U.S. Drought Monitor today. Um, so there's still some time to recover with spring storms, and that fire danger is likely going to persist until we see those grasses start to green up. The lack of snow cover on the plains from the warm temperatures melting the snow off quickly, as the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers noted that there was some midwinter runoff from the plains snow melt. Um, so that even though there is a lack of no, currently there was some snow, it just melted off um, a little bit quicker this year. And the below normal snowpack will likely result in below normal runoff in the rivers in the basin. And just a summary of the outlook, El Nino has been declared. Um, we're seeing higher chances for warm and dry conditions over the northern portion of the region. Um, that newly dr added drought in that area is expected to persist and potentially expand. Colorado and Wyoming have the highest chances for above average moisture through the summer season. And that drought in southeastern Colorado and Kansas is expected to improve, but we're also expecting to see the drought out in our western basins persist um, and possibly intensify in Colorado. The spring flood outlook has the highest potential for flooding in the lower Missouri River Basin and the lower Ohio River Valley. Um, just a little bit more information on the partners. Um, you can get today's and past recorded uh, presentations from both the Midwest and the High Plains Regional Climate Centers. Um, NOAA's National Climatic Data Center has monthly climate reports that you can access. Uh, the Climate Prediction Center has a, a lot of great outlooks you can go look at. Um, climate.gov, drought.gov, the state climatologists, and again, the Regional Climate Center partners. So with that, I'll take any questions. Uh, thank you, Wendy. And we will now open up the question and answer period. Please use star six to unmute your line before asking your question. Then when you are finished speaking, please use star six to mute your line again. Uh, we do have other panelists with us today. Uh, we do have Brian Fuchs from the National Drought Mitigation Center, Dennis Toddy with the South Dakota S State University, Jim Angel, uh, state climatologist uh, up in Champaign-Urbana, Illinois, and Kevin Lau with the Missouri Basin River Forecast Center who can speak to any hydrology uh, questions you may have. So uh, star six to unmute, and we're opening up the floor for questions. This is Sean in North Dakota. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead, yep. please. Okay, um, if you could go back to uh, that slide on the on the wildland fire, um, the map, the national map, a second. Just a question on that once you get it there. <clears throat> right there. Oh, go back the other direction one. Perfect. Okay. All right, I I'm assuming North Dakota is just missing data, um, and that really there should be almost a line from... Uh, where it's at the uh, north uh, west of South Dakota all the way on up to uh, Minnesota Canadian border roughly or line uh, somewhere along those that area is that a correct assumption or it is kind of odd that it just completely skirts North Dakota um, I don't really have a good answer does anyone else know how predictive services makes these forecasts Uh, we can look into it. Um. Yep. I mean, I'm I'm sure it's just missing data. You know, <clears throat> our political boundaries aren't that strong, 
And, yeah, uh, <laughs> good point. I was just going to say, uh, you know, even if we could have an idea where that, um, roughly that area of increase to above normal uh, would be yeah. in the state, I can kind of see where it might lie just based on how the lines are drawn on the rest of the map, but that would be appreciated if possible. This is Nancy Garter. Can you hear me? Yes, please. Hello? Go ahead. Yes, go ahead, please. Yes, yeah, so I had two questions. One, what gives you confidence that um, the abnormally dry conditions in Nebraska won't intensify into drought or persist? And then two, could you offer your perspectives, at least at this point, on what you think the severe weather season might look like? Thank you. Thank you for the question. Um, I'm assuming that the Nebraska drought is not forecast to persist because they weren't really forecast to have below normal moisture uh, through the growing season. Um, and Brian Fuchs might be able to add a little bit more to that since he's on the line as well. Um, and as far as the severe weather season, I think really all we have to go on is that, um, that article that we posted in the, on the one slide about um, lower <coughs> activity during El Nino events, even though this isn't a very strong one, um, that would probably come into play. But I'll let the other panelists add to that. This is Brian. Can you hear me? Mm. Yes, sir. Uh, Nancy, that's a good question. And I think it, it's one that we're just going to have to follow uh, going forward. There were some good comments this week on uh, the U.S. Drought Monitor discussion about that very topic. and. And uh, the, the comment that was made was if we uh, continue to go forward into April as we start seeing climatologically more precipitation expected, if we continue to see this dryness, then there wouldn't be uh, any question that uh, we may see some moderate drought develop. Uh, it really will di be dictated by what kind of precipitation we see going forward, especially once we hit April. So it sounds like maybe you're talking about climatology as being the ace in the pocket rather than some sort of weather pattern that you're looking at? Pretty much, pretty much. I and mean, if you looked at the, the products that Wendy showed as far as the outlooks go and, and uh, the forecast products, it, it, uh, it really dictates that we're right in the EC, climatological uh, forecast, no signal one way or the other. Uh, so we're, we're really going to be paying attention on what happens. Uh, and you may see a mixed message, too, especially if we get into excuse me, convective type of precipitation this spring. It could be uh, one of those that uh, very, over a very short distance you could see changes in a gradient. Okay. And another question. Uh, I don't know if you all could address this kind of odd winter we've had where we've had dry, 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 and then a huge deluge, and then dry, dry, dry again. It seems like it's been kind of wavy. and come in quick, hard burst. Does that ring a bell? <laughs> we all agree that it's been an odd winter in terms of uh, sort of broad climatological signals. And um, everyone, believe me, everyone in the business is struggling with um, cause and effect at this point. <clears throat> the fact that the El Nino is uh, just become re sort of recognized, if you will, in February, um, is a bit of, uh, you know, leads us to also kind of think that uh, th this this winter has been, a you know, an odd duck, so to speak. Um, so I don't know if anybody has the answer to that. We've had a very persistent ridge, in other words, high pressure, if you will, over the west. Sometimes that scoots out a little bit further to the east and gives us really nice temperatures, as we saw in January in the last couple weeks uh, in the Midwest. And the east, east of here, basically east of the Missouri uh, Basin, Mississippi Basin, Great Lakes, has been cooler than, const pretty much constantly cooler than normal, with a few shots of warm-ups here and there. Um, um, what is leading to all of that and what is keeping it so stable in that pattern, and you can look at the two-week and all that, um, it, it's really a tough, tough thing to talk about uh, and to understand. It's a lot of warm water off the Pacific coast. That helps keep that ridge in place. Um, but uh, 
I, I really don't want to go too much further <laughs> and get myself in trouble in, in sort of um, any kind of causative issues here. The El Nino really hasn't been a player until recently. Okay. If this continues, what does that bode for precip and drought in our area? Uh, I think Dennis should answer that question. <laughs> no, I, I, I don't have a good answer. I would say um, um, the indications of drier than normal up north in Minnesota, uh, maybe uh, eastern North and South Dakota and um, Wisconsin may be a foretelling of what's coming this summer. I, I, I sure hope not. Uh, but for the next few months, at least in terms of the prediction community, they believe that that area is going to there are better chances of staying dry, um, and the Southwest and maybe even Western Kansas and Southern uh, Colorado, to some respect, um, have better chances of being wetter than normal uh, for various reasons and such. So um, these are what the models uh, are agreeing with, and uh, that that's kind of what we're what we can say right now. I, I can't give you a, I'm not sure who can give you a. a really solid explanation on why it's turning out that way. Thank you, Doug. Thank you all. This is Mary from Kansas. Can you hear me? Yes, Mary. Uh, um, I'm just noting that for us in Kansas, if we do have a moderate to a moderate El Nino, we are um, kind of skewed towards wetter than normal conditions during our summer. So that but again, when you have such a weak El Nino, uh, the question is whether or not it will have the same impacts. Well, thank you for your questions. Uh, any other uh, last minute uh, thoughts or comments or questions we could help you with? Yes, good afternoon. This is Bryce Anderson. Hi, from DTN. Yes, thanks. Um, just for the sake of, uh, of mentioning it, um, it does appear that what we're seeing up in the uh, northern Midwest has some uh, similarity to three years ago in 2012. Um, it's not as dry as it was then, but uh, it's certainly approaching that. Uh, is that, is that uh, being... Uh, mentioned as as a uh, you know just keep an eye on it uh, type of thing uh, when when uh, some of these uh, discussions are, are going on in in uh, the uh, climate center well I hope it's not pointing towards another 2012 um, because that was just a terrible year for much of the central US um, I know that some people have noted that it's kind of eerily similar to 2012 um, in Colorado, we had our wettest February since 2012, which was not a very good indicator for me to see. Um, but I think we definitely saw things warm up quicker in 2012, and I'll let anybody else add to that. Um, if, if Bryce, this, similar. Uh, this is Brian Fuchs from the National Drought Mitigation Center, and I think Wendy's last comment was right on track that in, in 2012, through much of the Midwest and Central Plains, we, we saw those above normal temperatures all through the winter. And it, the maps that Wendy was showing, uh, most of the Midwest and Central Plains were below normal through much of the winter as far as temperatures go, and not until you got out to uh, Wyoming and Colorado did we see those temperatures above normal. And, and even with the few warm weeks that we had seen here in March, uh, the, the overall pattern has been uh, cooler than normal temperatures, where in 2012 uh, we saw uh, dormancy broke uh, early in March. Uh, water usage not only was being uh, uh, used by uh, plants during that time during the green up, but also we had the dry conditions on top of that along with the warm temperatures. So uh, some of those indicators are similar to what we saw in 2012 with the dryness, but I think the temperature component uh, has not been to that level and, and dissimilar up to this point. So again, if I had the crystal ball, I, I, I could uh, look, look better into the future. But uh, I think what, what we showed, what Wendy showed with the outlooks and, and what we're expecting here in the short term being the next two to three months is, is, is probably right on track. Well, I know that there's no, uh, no corn planting going on in, 
in Iowa in March are being talked about it uh, this year like there was then. So that is a good point. Thanks. Um, hi, this is Benjamin Diamond. Hi, Ben. Hello. Hello, go ahead. Hey, um, question. So temperature, the temperature component is dissimilar to 2012, but what about the precipitation component? Is it similar to 2012 or not? I, I think it's, it's probably yet to be seen. Okay. And um, I actually I'm trying to remember the 2012 winter. I remember it being very warm, but I I guess it was relatively dry as well. But certainly March, April was a little wetter, and May um, we missed everything. In June, obviously we missed everything, and, and much of us. Uh, so so those are really the telling months. Is the spring? We get the spring rains, and they're you know broadly across the region. We're we're all relatively happy. If we miss them we're in big trouble. That's <laughs> it, it, it's just the tail of the tail of the season really. And, and it's way too early to make uh, make any judgments at this point. I think in many places we do have um, and, and maybe others can talk better about this, but soil moisture is a key and and we have a number of people on that can speak to this. Um, uh, is the key to sort of early early uh, early crop issues and uh, certainly spring wheat, uh, winter wheat, and that kind of thing. So uh, um, I, I think there are a lot of places that soil moisture is, is okay for now, and I'm not sure we were in that boat in 2012. So, um, okay, thank you. Um, so so it's, 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 really, it's really too early and probably hard to compare to 2012 for a number of reasons. And remember, also back in March of 2012, we had at least a week, maybe two weeks in the 80s. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, and that was from the Great Lakes to uh, virtually the, the Rocky Mountains in that case. And, and it was unheard of. It was, I mean, that year was totally, uh, was a phenomenal year, not in a good way. I think, Doug, you also hit on a good point on the soil moisture. If we look back at the fall of 2011 and as we went into the winter of 2012, soil moisture recharge was at a minimum through much of the plains and, and Midwest. And as we went into spring, we did not have that uh, uh, situation where soil moisture was okay. We're, for most of those areas this year, we are doing okay, even though we have seen some dryness this winter. If you go back to think of the fall of 2014, much of this area did pick up some pretty good precipitation before uh, the soils went into the winter freeze. So again, that, that's a, a great point to make as far as uh, the conditions leading into uh, the 2012 growing season versus uh, 2015. Thank you. Oh, so this is Nancy again from the World Herald. Can you hear me? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Go ahead. This is a, a real narrow question here. You know, on Monday, temperatures really shot up in our area, and uh, we set a number of records for earliest this and earliest that. And, um, um, you know, I know we've been dry and sunny and all that stuff, but was any of that um, the hot, dry air coming in from uh, the west a sudden flush of that? Does that make sense? From California, New Mexico, was it hotter than normal air coming in and making those records possible? Does that make sense? As a question, yeah. I, I would venture to say um, that was more of a. You could also call it a downsloping sort of situation, as uh -huh. well as a pretty prominent ridge. And ridge means just a lot of high pressure over a particular area. Um, okay. Causing, uh, you know, if you will, downward motion, which causes warm, warm air to uh, sort of occur. Uh, it may have had a southwest component, where it came out of the southwest, but that's normal. There's nothing unusual about that, and so I would say no. Um, the dryness in the west probably didn't directly contribute to that. Okay. All right. Thank you. Hi, this is Bryce Anderson again. Uh, I know that California is obviously not part of the region, but um, 
I, I'm just uh, flabbergasted by the the degree of, of drought issues uh, that that continue to be talked about, and we're hearing about more emergency measures and so forth <clears throat> uh, being done. Um, ha- have you uh, had any comments from your colleagues in the West, in, in the far West region, that that uh, you could share as uh, regarding their concerns or uh, thoughts that they have about the situation? Brian, Do you want me to pick up on yeah, this Brian, one? Yeah, why don't you talk about it for a bit? Yeah, this is, Bryce, this is Brian Fuchs again from the National Drought Mitigation Center, and, and there's been uh, an ongoing commentary with uh, the folks out west through through much of the winter, especially as uh, we've we've been teased, I'll say, a couple different times by some, some pretty significant uh, weather events that hit portions of the west, but then again, uh, that moisture was coming as rain versus snow, isolated to uh, more of the northern reaches of California and to Oregon and Washington, and and not the the big uh, continual systems that we typically would expect in the winter out west. With that being said, uh, the water allocations that are are being the decisions that are being made right now are uh, are definitely on a decline. Uh, some good information came out of the the California State Climate Office yesterday. And, and they work with the Department of Water Resources in California talking about what deliveries would be on, on some of the state and federal projects. And, and what, what the big picture is, is it's going to be very similar to last year as far as agriculture goes. Uh, we're going to see producers that will continue to leave land fallow, if not fallowing more land this year. Uh, Timing of precipitation is crucial to the grazing efforts out there, so we're going to see uh, uh, not only the, the cattle and dairy industries continue to be uh, impacted, but there has been a migration of animals out of the state uh, going into places such as Idaho and Montana. Uh, again, with uh, the specialty crops out there, very water-intensive specialty crops, and also the nut trees, uh, many decisions are being made by these producers on, on what, what, what are they going to do. And the problem that we saw last year, their, their way that they mitigated these water issues was we saw a tremendous amount of groundwater pumping, which also caused issues around the state. That level of, of pumping of groundwater is not sustainable out there, and we've seen very little recharge of that groundwater up to this point from the heavy rain events that they saw in December and February. And so uh, going forward, uh, it's, it's just going to be a, a situation that's going to continue develop, to develop to develop, excuse me, with many decisions being made at the farm level. Uh, I was out there in November and met with the Cal- California Cattlemen's Association, and they, they had concerns at that point, uh, and, and that's just one group, but uh, again, it's throughout the ag community. Uh, if you're interested, we are having a U.S. Drought Monitor Forum in April out in Reno. Uh, and over the three days, we're going to be talking about issues with the Drought Monitor. Uh, the production likes, dislikes, how to make it better. But the last day of the meeting is actually focused on uh, the drought in the West. And there's going to be a lot of uh, good local commentary on what's been going on and, and how can we better assess conditions out in the West. So if you're interested in that, uh, let me know, or it's, it's posted on the, the National Drought Mitigation Center webpage as well. OK, sounds good. I, I appreciate that, Brian. Thank you. Yes. Okay, well, thank you everyone for joining us today for our monthly Central U.S. Climate Outlook. Uh, We would like to extend an invitation to you to join us for our next webinar uh, next month, and that will be on the third Thursday, which will be April 16th, also at 1 p.m. Central Time. Uh, Until then, and uh, for Wendy and all our panelists, uh, have yourself a good day. Bye-bye. Thanks.